Thank you very much indeed for coming to talk to us. Um, could I start just by asking you to explain to a non-technical audience, yes. what do you understand by the term risk adjustment? What, what does that, that term mean in practice? Yes, well first um, let me explain why we use it. In the Netherlands we have a system where people may choose their insurance every year. And the government requires the insurance companies to ask a flat rate premium to each person whether it's a young person, healthy, or an elderly person, or chronically ill. And we know uh, from actuarial sciences that the expected predicted expenditures have a substantial range, and that can vary from 400 for the young, healthy ones, to 40,000 or more for the elderly. Well, that's why we use risk-adjusted compensations to the insurers. So the insurer, so the people, the amount of money that they're paying for their health care is the same for everybody in the population. Exactly, that's but, equity. Yeah, but we think that some individuals are going to cost a lot, but yes. we can't distribute them evenly amongst the insurers. So that's the way right. to balance it out is yes. to use yes. to use risk adjustment. It's also to reward insurance insurers who purchase the best care for chronically ill. If they would not get a high compensation for chronically ill people, mm -hmm they would go bankrupt. Or they had to ask a, an, an extreme high premium, which people could not afford. So it is to protect insurance, insurers against uh, high risks and to re reward them for attracting chronically ill patients. And it's, it's also to prevent that insurers start risk selection or cream skimming. So by risk selection and cream skimming, do you want to explain what those terms mean to, to the audience? Um, well, uh, let's assume the risk-adjusted compensations that insurers now receive would only be based on age and gender, mm -hmm. uh, but not on health status. Then insurers know exactly who within each age gender group are the 10-20% chronically ill people who had ha high cost in the past and will have it in the future, and who are the 80% healthy ones who have below average cost within that age gender group. And then of course, if they receive the same compensation, they will try to attract as much of the healthy ones and to get out of the, not to attract the chronically ill. So, so in other words, they can that boost their profit by making themselves more attractive to lower risk yes, uh, patients. Yes, and that, that's a form of risk selection. And yeah. in health insu insurance companies are very clever in, and they have so many selection techniques. Although they must accept everybody, there are so many subtle uh, techniques they can apply yeah. to attract the good risk. So, in fact, it's uh, it's battle between the regulator uh, and the insurers, where the regulator must try to risk adjust these compensations to the insurers as as much as possible. Great. How long has risk adjustment been used in the Netherlands? We started in the early 90s, and then we had a very primitive risk adjustment formula, only based on age and gender. Mm -hmm. But over time, the government has really improved the formula. And now we have several health indicators. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by health indicators? Indicators um, for people who are chronically ill. Um, for instance, people who have diabetes or, or cancer patients, heart patients, or renal dialysis uh, problems. And the insurers receive 5,000 or 10,000 or even 20, 30,000 euro more for these people than for the average people in an age gender group. And the actual um, risk adjustment model that you use in the Netherlands, yes. uh, who developed that and how is that run in practice? Huh. It's a domestic formula. Um, I think in, in a lot of the formula has been developed uh, within Erasmus University, within our research group. And uh, we sold a lot of that to, to, the go to the government, and the government accepted it. And now there are three or four research groups working on risk adjustment in the Netherlands. So you're continually adjusting the formula as part of this battle against the insurers. Is that how you, yes. you describe it? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's one issue. And the other issue is the technical aspect. How do you collect the data? In practice, that turns out to be very complex. And what data go into the models that you've got? Presumably it's demographics, things like age and the gender. Demographics, yes. But the, the crucial question is, how can we measure health mm. in such a sense that we can predict an individual's future expenditures? Mm. And health has many dimensions. 
So what, what we do is primarily look at their prior healthcare utilization. Is For that, instance, is that ho kind of hospital data you've been talking it about? It could now? be hospital data, yes. That means a person who has been hospitalized uh, last year or the year before for cancer or a heart problem. You can predict that these persons next year will also have high expenditures. And then we use actuarial uh, uh, statistical methods to exactly calculate their predicted above average expenditures within their age gender group. So you've got demographics in there, you've got hospital activity, are there other yes. data s sources that you're pulling in? Or? Yes, a very powerful predictor is also uh, based on prescriptions. But that's a difficult one. Why is uh, it difficult? Well, we, can, we try to group patients based on their prior use of prescription drugs. Uh, let's say people who have used insulin, most likely are diabetic patients. So we group them. And then we can calculate what are the above average future expenditures for diabetic patients within their age gender group. But that may turn out to be say 2000 euro. But the cost of prescribing it may be only 400 euro. So there might be a perverse incentives for the doctors or the insurers just to prescribe it. It costs 4000 and the reward next year is 2000. So this is another example of gaming that gaming and that sort of problem and we have to deal with that how do you deal with that problem well in the end by excluding 90 percent of all the prescriptions not using them because for this reasons and many other reasons we cannot use them another problem is that certain drugs are not unique for a certain disease so it could be a very ch cheap disease or very expensive yeah. well we cannot use that drug so but the in the end we created what we called a pharmacy cost, pharmacy related cost group, which is uh, very predictive. And what kind of medicines are, you said there's about 10% of medicines actually make it into that. What kind of things would they be? I, I cannot give you exact, okay. uh, but, but the insulin is a very standard uh, right. uh, answer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And another predictor that the Dutch government is going to use in 2012 is multiple year high cost in the past. From research we found that those, there are many patients who are not compensated because of these uh, pharmacy-based cost group or the diagnostic cost group. Uh, a problem group is people with a rare disease and there are thousands of rare diseases. So it's hard to apply the law of the large numbers to small groups. But what these rare diseases have in common that in the past they had high expenditures. So now we look at those patients, insureds, who in the last three years were in the top 10% of the expenditure distribution after adjusting for the other risk adjusters. And we calculate what are the predicted additional expenses for them next year. And that's what the Dutch mm -hmm. government is going to implement. So, so it's a constant fight yeah. to improve the formula and to prevent insurers from selection. Mm -hmm. And so how many years worth of, of data have you, have you got to analyse? You said you, you're looking yes. at past years. Well, that's the development of the last year and that is the illustration of the practical problems you have with risk adjustment. Uh, it's a hell of a job to get the right data uh, for one year, but one year is not enough because you, you need to make predictors. Mm. So at least you have to have prior data and uh, the year of prediction. But if you look at multiple data, you need to have this, uh, you, you must follow a patient. The same individual. And yeah. that's quite, uh, well, maybe unique, but in the Netherlands, because each insured has a unique uh, number. Yeah. And if you switch insurer, we can still follow that, yeah. that insured. So that's a bit time. like the NHS number that we have in England. Okay, yes. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, we are building up a longitudinal database of all the 16 million people in the Netherlands, yeah. I think now over five years, and it's all in the computer of my colleague next door. Right. And all presumably in de-identified format, so you wouldn't have uh, any... Yes, of course, a lot of uh, privacy protection. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. we have a lot of like, legislation. Yeah. That again takes a lot of effort to get the data in the right format. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. And, and Netherlands is very famous for the strength of your primary care, but you've got a very strong history of general practice. Are there any variables from general practice systems that you can incorporate in your models, or is it mainly hospital data? 
the prescriptions, 90% of prescriptions are from the general practitioners. And I think we can improve the formula by not only looking at diagnostic codes from prior hospitalization, but also from outpatient care. And in the Netherlands, we have, the government has developed a new product system for all the care delivered by the hospital, either inpatient or outpatient care, that so-called diagnostic treatment combination. It's like a DRG, but the DRG is only for inpatient hospitalization. And this is for any episode of illness after the GP has referred you to a, a specialist. So DRG is a diagnostic resource group, is that right? Yes, yeah. that's yeah. right. But we have a product defined not only for hospitalization, but also outpatient care before hospitalization or after hospitalization. So we have much more indicators for diagnosis. And that means we can use the diagnose independent of the place of treatment. That can be a next step to improve the formula. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing this technique in, in, in the short term? To improve the predictive power and to get uh, insurers uh, away from risk selection. Yeah. <clears throat> but government can also say to the insurers, we really intend for the next three to five years to continuously improve the formula. And then the insurers are uncertain because someone who is unprofitable this year after improving the formula may become profitable next year. Okay. And that keeps them a little bit so away from selection. And another argument why insurers are a little bit reluctant to openly select is reputation. They are very sensitive for a loss of reputation. So they don't want to have a head in the newspaper, insurer X um, gives poor care to chronically ill people, heart patients, cancer patients or whatever, because at the end of the year, they will lose a quarter of their members and the next year they go bankrupt. So reputation is very important for them. But there are still many subtle ways they can perform risk selection and we have to prevent it.